another wave of xenophobia in South Africa. Attacks against migrants in the country have been multiplying since late March. The violence, which started in the coastal city of Durban, has now spread inland into Johannesburg, the country's largest city, where mobs have targeted foreigners and foreign-owned stores. At least seven people have been killed and thousands displaced. But the bloody disturbances has come as no surprise to South Africans who considered it a direct result of the ongoing demonization of foreigner nationals in the country. What broke the camel's back this time were hateful remarks by the Zulu king who called the millions of mostly African immigrants living in South Africa lice and ants. The government is now trying to contain the situation by deploying the military in the affected areas, but many say it is not doing enough. The recent riots could pose a serious threat to the post-apartheid democracy in the country. Our focus this week is on South Africa. Welcome to our Focus on South Africa, where hundreds of African migrants fearing for their safety are fleeing the country. Now let's get updated with the latest regarding these deadly attacks over there with our first guest for today, Sasha Vine, who is now in Johannesburg joining us. Hey Sasha, thank you for being on our show. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, so who are the migrants under threat? Who is attacking them and where are they coming from? Obviously. Um, Many of the immigrants that are coming through our borders, whether legal or illegal, are typically targeted in areas um, where they're perceived to be uh, taking jobs away from the South African citizens that live in these uh, townships, as you can see. Um, basically, many of them are coming from other African countries, the majority of them uh, you know, leaving war-torn -torn African um, you know, uh, areas but also coming here for a chance at a better life. And can these attacks be directly related to the Zulu King's comment about migrants taking jobs from citizens or was the tension actually evident before? Well, we did have several attacks earlier this year, and in 2008, uh, the attacks were far more violent and more people were killed. Since then, I think that our government have learned its lessons, and uh, good Will Zuelentini is uh, the Zulu king, uh, that's one of the tribes here in South Africa, and he has a lot of sway with the people. It's a, it's a very large community of our African citizens, in which he only said that criminal illegals, in other words, illegal immigrants who are perpetrating cr crimes should be deported, uh, which was largely then taken out of context or used by criminals as a scapegoat reason why they would attack foreign shop owners. Interesting. And Sasha, how proactive is the South African government against these attacks? The government has actually been very uh, forthcoming in these recent attacks. Uh, they, the president, uh, President Jacob Zuma, did say to all of his ministers and cabinet that they themselves must go into the townships or the areas where this is happening and calm the residents. We are not a nation um, you know, that <laughs> perpetuates murder and crime and all the, that's not what we want to be, obviously. And Sasha, it is true that the situation, the security situation in Johannesburg has deteriorated lately but you know even before the city is quite infamous for its uh, high crimes of rape of um, um, murder so how is this reality being sensed on the ground obviously uh, crime is high in South Africa but I think that in any country in the world you should have a high level of vigilance uh, I know for a fact I've lived in America and Europe and I you know, took defensive classes because as a woman you're always a target in any country. Uh, I must admit that I have been attacked actually just down the road here uh, where I was in an attempted car hijacking. Yes, uh, we do have a high uh, statistic of rape. I believe it's one every four minutes. Mm. Um, and that's obviously something that we need to work on. But you should understand that in our suburbs, our suburbs are very much like first world countries where the crime is on par with any first world country. Sasha, thank you so much for all this information and your personal insights. Okay, thank you very much for having me on the show.
The Nelson Mandela Foundation was established in 1999 when its founder, Nelson Mandela, ended his term as president of South Africa. It provided the base for his charitable work. A few years ago, the foundation made a transition into the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory, an organization focused on legacy work. Now, to hear about Mandela's legacy, we're joined by Mr. Vern Harris, director of research and archives of the foundation. Hi, Mr. Harris. Thank you for being with us. It's a great pleasure. So tell us a bit about the foundation. What kind of activities do you run there? Well, we promote Nelson Mandela's legacy uh, through memory work and dialogue work. This was a mandate that he gave to us after he stepped away from public life. And uh, any special plans for Freedom Day, which we know you're celebrating this week? What, what is it exactly? Well, Freedom Day is the anniversary of the first democratic election, uh, the 27th of April, 1994. So this is the 21st anniversary. The significance of this year is that what it means is that as a democracy, we are now officially adults. We're no longer teenagers. Uh, it's time for us to learn to stop behaving like teenagers. Interesting that you say that in light of recent events. And I want to ask you, are you also engaged in other countries across Africa or maybe with other African communities within your country? Well, many of our projects do involve that kind of engagement. In fact, after 2008, when there was again uh, this uh, uh, violence directed at people perceived to be foreigners, especially from other parts of Africa, we uh, went into 11 communities where this had happened over a period of nearly three years, running dialogues to try to understand better what had happened and to try to enable uh, communities to reunite. And we heard that recently you came out with a new app called Madiba's Journey. What's behind this new initiative and how does it actually work? Well, part of the work that we do on an ongoing way is to provide an integrated information resource on Nelson Mandela's life and times. Obviously, new technologies uh, are coming out all the time and particularly to reach young audiences, you have to be uh, using those technologies. So this mm -hmm. app is about uh, enriching the experience of both South Africans and people from other countries in terms of uh, visiting sites of historical significance around South Africa. Sounds cool. Thank you so much, Mr. Harris. Great pleasure. You take care. And now what else is going on in South Africa? The Israeli government decided to deny a visa to South Africa's higher education minister. The minister was scheduled to travel to a conference in the West Bank, marking the opening of the Center for African Studies from April 25th to 29th. Ahead of World Malaria Day, South Africa said it plans to eliminate the disease completely by 2018. According to the World Health Organization's 2014 report, malaria killed an estimated 528,000 people in sub-Saharan Africa in 2013. The government of South Africa has launched a mobile application to support its efforts against attacks on foreign nationals. The We Are Africa mobile application is meant to provide an online platform to pledge their support for the campaign against the attacks. South African soccer legend John Mushu passed away last week at the age of 49 after a long battle with cancer. Nicknamed Shoes, Mushu had a career that spanned more than two decades and was a household name for local soccer fans. A leading European travel company has ranked the South African passport among the most useful for traveling. The list compiled by Go Euro ranked the countries according to the ease of obtaining a passport, the cost of a passport, and the length of time it remains valid. Benjamin Pogrand grew up in Cape Town and started his journalism career in Johannesburg, writing for the Rand Daily Mail. Back in the 1960s, this was the only newspaper in South Africa at the time to report on events in black South African townships. In the course of his reporting, he came to know the major players in the apartheid struggle and gained the respect and confidence of leaders such as Nelson Mandela. In 1997, he moved to Israel and he's joining us today from Jerusalem. Hello, Benjamin. Hello. Um, tell us a bit about some of the major events that you have covered as a journalist in South Africa and what kind of impact did they leave on your life when you look back? Well, that's a very big question with a, <laughs> a big answer which I'll try and give as quickly as possible. All right. Because I started off opposing apartheid when I was a student at the University of Cape Town. And I was in the student leadership which fought against apartheid. I then joined the Rand Daily Mail and I was there for 26 years, landing up as deputy editor 
So I was there pretty much all the way through, the worst things. And I examined apartheid, I investigated it, I reported terrible stories, I reported beautiful stories about people who crossed the lines of division to keep in touch, to make friends. And you had a personal connection, as you said before, with Nelson Mandela. What do you mostly remember from him? Was there a certain side of him that maybe not everybody was exposed to? Well, the point that I always remember about him, and I've said a lot about this and written about it, I use the word generosity about him. And there are all sorts of ways during my many years with him, but really the most important one goes right back to 1961, when he'd been working underground to organize a huge nationwide strike against the apartheid government. And I was reporting it. And the security police came and saw me and my editor and warned us we were facing prosecution because we were reporting on what was going on, and we went on reporting. But on the day of the strike, my newspaper, the leading liberal paper at the time, in a most extraordinary series of mistakes, and this happens on newspapers, it's not conspiracy, it's cock-up, made a terrible mistake and came out with a huge headline that the strike had failed, which it hadn't. And I was sitting in my office miserable, depressed, what my newspaper had done to Mandela, because it killed the strike, and in mid-morning, from underground, he phoned me. And I heard that warm, cheery voice, and he said to me, I sort of stammering an apology. Nelson, I'm sorry. We made a terrible mistake. <coughs> and this incredible voice came over. He called me Benji Boy. He said, it's all right, Benji Boy. I know it wasn't your fault. And it was the most amazing thing for a man to do. And um, last week, Israel refused to grant a visa to a cabinet minister in South Africa from the Communist Party there who wanted to pass through Israel en route to the Palestinian Authority. I wanted to ask you how tense is the situation now between the two countries? Well, it, there's a lot of feeling building up against South Africa. It comes from a, a misunderstanding by a lot of black people there where they identify what they suffered under apartheid with what they are told and what is they see happening over here. I reject the comparison between Israel and apartheid, mm -hmm. but a lot of black people see it there and they empathize with Palestinians. Benjamin, interesting points. Thank you so much for your analysis. Thank you very much. Sports has always been part of South Africa's DNA. Its cricket and rugby teams especially used to be among the best in the world, but the biggest sports-related story of the past year had nothing to do with the playing field, although the central character was a sportsman. Olympian Oscar Pistorius stood trial after he shot and killed his girlfriend. Now we want to get updated with local sports from a local perspective, with stories that went a bit more under the radar, and say hi to Carol Chabalala, the first lady of sports in South Africa, for years, she has been the female face of SABC Sports. Harry, hi, Carol. Thank you for being with us. Only a pleasure. Hi. So, Carol, what are the latest stories we should get updated with uh, in the South African sports? The latest headlines, um, well, we're reaching the end of our local Premier Soccer League um, and we've got uh, a team here, Kaiser Chiefs, who, who led from the start of the season up until the very end. They've uh, just been confirmed as the APSA Premiership Champions. So we've got our local footballing champions with four games to go till the end of the season. So great excitement about that. But an announcement that was made last week is that the NBA officially announced that South Africa, Johannesburg, on the 1st of August, will be staging the very first NBA game. So um, for those of us that love the game of basketball, I mean, this is, this is absolutely, it's an historic moment, and we can't wait till uh, the 1st of August. Sounds cool. But um, Carol, from a five years perspective, how beneficial or profitable, if at all, was the hosting of the World Cup for your country? So I know the big question that's been asked is that so much um, you know, financial aid is needed to stage an event of this magnitude. So it really took a lot out of the country. What do we get back? Besides yeah. the reputation, besides um, the wonderful infrastructure, the roads that were built, um, the stadiums that were um, upgraded, the new stadium that was built and, and remains to this day, we've got that to hold on to. We've got the memories to cherish. And Carol, in what way do sports and politic, uh, politics affect each other in your country? Do South African athletes speak out? Do they turn vocal when it comes to political issues? 
Oh, they certainly do. I mean, um, um, I know whenever there's um, something topical right now, we're talking about um, xenophobia issues, saying no to xenophobia. The Premier Soccer League, um, the captains before every game um, actually stand up. They, they, they speak out about this. Uh, we play the African Union uh, um, anthem. We then play the South African anthem. Um, the same can be said in all of our different sporting codes. Whenever we have our teams representing us on a national level, you know, we play that national anthem. Sporting icons and sport as a design, because it's got such a big, big following, it really lends itself to making those involved in sports. Uh, by the way, what's the most popular sports there? Um, it's most certainly football, followed by uh, cricket and rugby, or followed by rugby and then cricket. Yeah, top three. <laughs> Carol, thank you so much for this interview. It's only been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Keep Love on. her spirit. And thank you all also for focusing with us on South Africa. Keep watching. Keep following. Till next time.